So hi everyone, my name is uh, Enrique Rodriguez. I work for an awesome company called Not On Ice Trips. And this, is, this tells you the journey, how we went from the place we were before to the brave new world of Docker and containers. So just some, a little bit about Not On High Street. We are the UK's largest curated marketplace. Uh, we have more than 500, uh, 5,000 partners with 170,000 products. Um, selling on our website. This is mostly um, small businesses from the UK selling really nice original um, custom products. Um, we have around 200 employees, 50 tech people uh, divided between uh, DevOps, uh, developers, and, and other areas of business. So this story um, is how we were one year ago. Um, Not High Street exists for nine years now, and we were in a really good place in terms of technology. Uh, mostly we had a single uh, Ruby on Rails uh, service. We call it the Mononauts because it's a monolithic application for Not On High Street. It's a nice name. Around 150 servers, both physical and uh, virtual servers. So you know the, dr the drill, using Puppet for configuration management, uh, running in OpenStack, Runback providing the, the whole um, uh, orchestration, orchestration bits. Um, best practices, one server equals one function with clusters of servers. So we were in a, a, a really, really nice place. Even with continuous integration and delivery, it's, it's, it's kind of a dream come true in terms of DevOps. But then something changed. We needed to build more services. And all this talk about microservices came about. So we had this really big monolithic application that we needed to kind of chip down, create new services from this, expand our technology range. So a lot of new challenges came along. The way we used to do things before, it was very good for a single application, or maybe two applications. But if you have 50 developers that they want to build their own services, it's, it's really very hard to deploy all the services. So we're now going to have a lot more services. We're going to have all these different uh, technology stacks, different ways of doing deployments. We needed to be able to scale to more servers, bigger servers, and we need to do it faster. As well, we need to. If, if we want to deploy a server in um, or a service in, in a single day, would that be possible? Well, not where we where we were before. Also, when you have a lot of different uh, servers, you have a lot of maintenance overhead. A new patch comes along, and you have to be prepared for that. It was quite easy to do, but still, there was a bit of an overhead. And of course, the technology to replicate and clone DevOps. We, we haven't mastered that yet. We're getting there, but not just yet. Of course, a solution that everyone is thinking about, containers, Docker containers. They're uh, small, they run really fast, it's easy to create. You can shift them around, so a developer builds a container and you push that container into production. Everything is awesome, or is it? It's not a silver bullet. So what Docker does is it encapsulates your service. So it's very easy to run that service because the environment of the service no longer depends on the environment of the server. 
and it's it, it's very easy. You want to install Java, you want to install Ruby. You don't want to conflict the version of Ruby that you want your service to run in, or the version of Ruby that your server runs. But Docker doesn't take care of uh, uh, all the rest. Configuration management. There's no persistent data, so logs the way people traditionally perceive them, you can't use them anymore. And there is no orchestration as well. So Docker can still solve a lot of your problems, but using it alone, it's not the solution. You have to build something better. So building a dream. We wanted a scalable infrastructure with Docker. And we wanted to do all the configuration of the services, all the logs. Uh, creating new services should be very, very easy. And developers should have all the power to do this by themselves. Kind of a kitty metaphor thing. So you have this uh, kitty litter, and each kitty is a microservice. And you want to have that box so you can put kitties, remove kitties. If one kitty dies, you just replace it with another kitty. You can expand the box to have more kitties. So after a lot of thinking, we reach uh, the conclusion that these were the technologies we're kind of looking for. We try them. We like them. Docker for containers, Mesos to run the, um, all, the, all the clustering. Console is a key value store. Elk stack for, uh, for logs. We would also try running things in AWS at the same time that we were doing all this change, Ansible for the orchestration bit, and then some bits of uh, glue. So about Docker. So mostly everyone here has heard of Docker. Uh, good things is everyone can write their own uh, Docker containers. So developers would be able to do this by themselves. They define their own infrastructure. They don't have to wait for, for DevOps. Deployment now became really easy because if, you're deploying, if everything is a Docker container, all deployments are basically the same. No need to use uh, deployment strategies that are specific to some technologies. Uh, containers are immutable, so there's no maintenance. If you need to upgrade something, just create a new one, kill the old one. And we try to run everything with Docker, including infrastructure services like Logstash or Elasticsearch. Even the Mesos master themselves run as Docker containers. So Mesos is a clustering environment that has a bunch of capabilities, and you have some frameworks on top of it. And the way you interface with Mesos is you talk to those frameworks. Two examples of frameworks are Marathon and uh, Kronos. In a nutshell, you use Marathon to run long-running uh, tasks like services. And Kronos, you use it to run Chrono-like jobs. So Mesos knows how to speak Docker. So you, you just tell Marathon, Marathon, please, will you run this Docker container 30 times? And Marathon will say, sure, I'll make it, I'll make it happen. And it will talk back with Mises and say, I need 30 of these. And Mises will just make it happen, if you have resources, of course. Um, the key value store that we use, console, we use it to store both configuration and, and template. So it's kind of a single source of truth. Now, you, can, you have a lot of APIs, and you also have a UI that you can interact with. So uh, your service can talk with console directly, or uh, a developer can just go into console and see what is this value, and it will check exactly what the configuration value is. We also use something called console template, which will monitor what happens in console and write files on the Mesos hosts that correspond to whatever you, you want, uh, basically. You, you have a template, you have some values, you mix them together, you create a file. Now, if you're building a service, a new service, you can do whatever you want. So you can query console straight away to know 
the default values that you, your, your application um, needs to have in that environment, or you can just read from a file. This allows us to both support new services and also old services or even infrastructure services like Elasticsearch that only know how to read configuration files. Uh, speaking of Elasticsearch, this is, you should use something like this if you don't already. So basically, Elk Stack is three services, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Logstash will grab all your logs together, parse them, send them to Elasticsearch, and then you can visualize those logs in Kibana. Now, everything belongs to the same company now, so they all interface really well with, with, with each other. Uh, for example, Kibana, you just point it to a log stash, to uh, Elasticsearch that has, been, that has the logs of Logstash, and Kibana automatically gives you a whole bunch of information. So the way you try to standardize this is all services, we define that all services should write their logs as uh, uh, JSON, in the JSON format that Logstash can understand. So if all the services are on board, then you only need one rule. You say, go there to pick up the logs, and you know what to do because this is in the format that you accept. No longer we need to define a, a specific custom um, um, regular expression to parse some logs. So this is all done through, through in the services themselves, if they are good citizens. Oh, once again, this means that if your container dies, if your host dies, your logs are safe somewhere. While all of this is happening, we also decided to move the way to AWS because we needed to scale uh, better, faster. And if you have noticed already, AWS is really scalable. Um, also, this gives us the opportunity to, have, to use the exact same architecture for both production and QA. So a developer can create QA environments at will, and it will be exactly the same as production, everything. Each QA environment will have its own Mesos, Elk stack, console, he, so the developer can try things on his own um, without going to production directly. Like I mentioned before, we try to run everything in Docker. So the easiest way for us that we found to, to do this, we, we create a single AMI for all the, the AWS uh, EC2 instances. And then it's up to the instance to see what kind of node am I, and I'm going to enable the services that I think it's appropriate for this. So if it's an Elasticsearch node, it will enable Elasticsearch and not Mesos, for example. Ansible, we, we found that Puppet was being too restrictive for our own usage. So we wanted something which will give us a bit more oomph. Um, Ansible, I think, was is a really nice tool. It's, a, it's not a configuration management tool. It's more of an orchestration tool that also does configuration management. Masterless, we don't need to worry about having a, a, a central server anymore. It integrates really well with AWS. And you, it's very extensible. We build some custom extensions for it so we can talk with Marathon directly to deploy some services. So Ansible will just say, Please, Marathon, do this, and Marathon will comply. We also use it to push all the information needed to console. So if you're building a new service, you build your, um, your role in Ansible as well, and that will make sure that your service is deployable, has configuration in the right place, all the shebang. We use Jenkins for our continuous integration and continuous delivery systems. Five? Cool. And this means that if you're testing a service and if it's OK, you want to deploy it. So you build your own, all in the same tool, you build your Docker container and you deploy that Docker container. 
So Jenkins is the, is the one that triggers everything, and it will call Ansible to do the hard work. Of course, all, of, all these tools need to work together as well. Um, we use custom Nginx and PowerDNS to do the routing bit. Everything is backed by console. So when a new service comes along, and Registrator is a very good service for that as well, you, you start a new Docker container in Mesos. Registrator will say, this is a new service. It just started. So I'm going to go into console, and I will register this instance of the service in console. So console knows all about this. If that Docker container dies, it gets removed from, from console. So if you're sitting on your desktop and want to access your service, you write your URL to get to that service. It will reach um, via PowerDNS and Nginx. It will reach the services exactly that are running, uh, the, the, the nodes that are running that service. It works really well. So this is kind of a scary overview of uh, what all of this looks like. So as you can see, Jenkins trigger both the creation of the Docker containers and also triggers the Ansible jobs. Ansible will talk with AWS and say, I need resources. I need a database. I need memcached. I need a load balancer to take care of this. I need some nodes to run whatever. Using CloudFormation, AWS will make this happen for you. Ansible will also talk with console, say, please put the configuration how it's supposed to be. And you tell Marathon, there's the service that I want. Please run this service X amount of times. Or make sure that this service is running X amount of times. Um, Marathon will say, I accept, I accept your challenge. So I will tell the Mesos master, I want to run this container X amount of times. And Mesos master will say, I know exactly where to run this. I have these Mesos slaves running around, spreading around. So I will say, run to here, run three there, and you have those services running. So at this stage, console template has already picked up the configuration from console and has written the configuration files. So when the Docker container starts, it will mount a volume with the right configuration. So the services only need to know my configuration will be in that folder. Or if you want to, you just talk directly with console. And you, have, you can also have some strategies. You can monitor that folder and say, if the config configuration changes, please reload the application, if you want to. OK, so at this stage, we now have our service running on the Mesos slaves. Um, using Docker, of course. All the logs will go into the ALK stack, and also monitoring if you use something like StatsD. Um, you'll just send the information there. Now, a funny thing about this is all of this can be done by developers themselves. They don't need DevOps to do this for them. It was one of our goals is making sure that developers have all the tools they need to do their job in an efficient way while we maintain all the, all the back end. Um, just to end this presentation, it has been exactly 11 months since we, well, actually no, two, 12 months. So we started running this in production in late August. Took 11 months since someone had the idea of saying, let's look at Docker to have our entire production um, infrastructure running with Docker. A very bleeding edge technology. You will 
bleed because you will hit some bugs. It's not perfect. It happened at, at, at points we were running beta versions of some of those tools, RC versions of some of those tools because the bug just was fixed just then, so we had to go with it. And please, please, please make the developers a part of the entire process because they're the ones using your system. And you want them to love the system, not hate the system, because they, it always works for them, right? So we, you have to show them there is something better. And hack days are really important. This actually came from a hack day. So please do that. And we're done.